Hey guys, how you doing? It's good to see you again. Before I start tonight, I want to thank you for a great year. Um, under really difficult circumstances, you guys have been, been great and uh, it's been my pleasure to work with you throughout the year. Uh, we have uh, the lecture today, we have a lecture tomorrow, and then on Tuesday is the final lecture and um, our final quiz of the year will be on Wednesday over World War II. And uh, of course, uh, tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday, 10 a.m., office hours, if I can answer any questions for you. Okay, guys, as you know, this is a global war. World War II is global. We've already been um, uh, looking at the European theater of World War II, the Battle of Britain, Operation Barbarossa. Today, we turn our focus to the Pacific theater of World War II, the Pacific theater. When you think of the Pacific theater of World War II, your mind uh, automatically thinks of the American and the Japanese experiences during this conflict. Let's uh, today look at the Japanese first. Let's trace the rise of Japanese militarism uh, to 1905. 1905, known as the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese are going to score a tremendously shocking victory over the mighty Russian Empire. So Japan defeats Russia. This turned the diplomatic world on their collective ears. They could not believe that this tiny island nation or empire could defeat Russia. So it becomes um, a building block of sorts, a foundational piece to explain the meteoric rise, the rapid ascension of the Japanese uh, nation or empire and their military. Let's go to the 1930s, shall we? Um, 1930s, we're going to see by 1931 certainly that Japan has become a growing uh, militaristic and expansionistic and imperialist nation. They're defined by militarism and expansionism during this time period. Very important symbolic moment uh, in our narrative is the 1931 invasion by Japan of Manchuria. So in 31, Japan invades Manchuria. Manchuria is essentially, it's the northern sector of China, mainland China. So we're going to see now the Chinese are going to offer a plea to the League of Nations. They say, hey, you were created for this moment. We need your intervention on our behalf against these Japanese imperialists. So again, they appeal to the League of Nations and there is really nothing in the way of military intervention by, by Wilson's 14 point, Wilson's baby. They don't do anything. And really this is a precursor for what happened in 35 when Mussolini and the Italians invade um, Ethiopia, same result, nothing to support the underdog uh, in any way, shape, or form. So, let's fast forward here a little bit. Invasion of Manchuria, nothing happens, maybe a perhaps slay, uh, slap on the wrist. Let's fast forward to 1936 and 37. This is going to be the moment that sort of defines uh, this image crafted or shaped of the Japanese military and the Japanese state. This is the invasion of mainland China. They invade the rest of China in 36 and 37. And again, uh, it's a very brutal attack. It's sadistic, it's nefarious, it's uh, barbaric. Before I get to the actual events of this uh, attack on China, let me talk to you a little bit about maybe the philosophical bent or the spirit, uh, the fighting mentality of the Japanese army and where it came from. The Japanese military had a very, very singular focus in terms of how they wanted to fight. And it was definitely defined by a certain uh, cruelty, a uh, negative energy, maybe a hate for their opposition. But all of that was um, created by a very strong uh, enthusiasm or zeal uh, bordering on religious for their emperor and the Japanese Empire. Now the emperor was Hirohito. So Emperor Hirohito was viewed by his people uh, in a divine concept. He was seen as a divine entity uh, or as a god. Japanese soldiers believed that if they died uh, at battle or on the battlefield, that would assure their place in heaven and would surely purify their souls. My point is, they would never surrender. They were a, a terrible and worthy opponent because they believed if they died fighting for Hirohito and the empire, they would go to heaven and purify their souls. 
Um, so with that in mind, they didn't have a lot of regard for fair play or for the other side, uh, the other opponent, in terms of how uh, things went down on the battlefield. 1936 and 37 is the invasion of China, as I mentioned. Really, this um, event is um, it's really associated and defined by the invasion of a city known as Nanking. So Nanking, spelled N-A-N-K-I-N-G, the Japanese invasion and attack on Nanking is known today as the Rape of Nanking. Okay, the Rape of Nanking, and we see here, and certainly, you know, propaganda years later during the wartime, World War II, it tells the story about Nanking through uh, really, really negative portrayals and imagery of the Japanese soldier. But at Nanking, you know, 40 to 45,000 uh, Chinese civilians, men, were killed, and 20 to 25,000, according to the figures, 25,000 women were raped uh, during the rape of Nanking. And there is all kinds uh, of really, really horrific, brutal, barbaric anecdotes about the attack on Nanking. And uh, today is not the platform right here to discuss those things, but uh, really, really uh, difficult uh, anecdotes and difficult storylines to, um, to look at the uh, Japanese attack on Nanking. Fast forward here a little bit. Uh, following um, the attack on China, we're going to see in the late 30s and the early 40s that the Japanese imperialism only intensifies, partially because the European colonists, so the European countries that had um, or controlled colonies uh, in the Far East, they turn their focus away from those holdings and they turn their, their eyes back to Europe as World War II broke out uh, their focus, their sole focus, was uh, projected onto Hitler and the Nazi Germany uh, attack uh, and encroachment on Europe. Point is, is that those Europeans in the Far East largely abandoned their colonial properties and left them there for the taking for, in this case, the Japanese. So in the late 30s, early 40s, we're going to see the Japanese gobble up places like Java, uh, Borneo, Burma, New Guinea, Hong Kong, Singapore, all controlled previously by European nations and they're all now taken on by the, the new burgeoning developing Japanese empire. Uh, so at this time, uh, a good time for us to mention here that in 1940, a pretty important, uh, a significant document or pact was signed known as the Tripartite Pact. The Tripartite Pact uh, World War II had already began in Europe, and we're going to see that the Tripartite Pact, it's spelled uh, T-R-I-P-A-R-T-I-T-E, it's signed between, again, two earlier allies, Germany and Italy, but they include now in the mix the Japanese as well. So it's Japan, it's Italy, and it's Germany. It's really a recognition of the three different nations mutual interest in imperialism, their imperialist ambitions and tendencies. So again, it becomes the basis as the war moves along for the Axis powers in World War II. Again, they're all imperialists, they're all aggressive in their tactics, um, and uh, it includes Italy and Germany and the Japanese. Okay, the Tripartite Pact. At this time, let's turn our focus a little bit to America. What is the U.S. government up to in the 1930s? What is their perspective on this developing uh, sense of uh, futility and pending war in Europe? In the 1930s, of course, America is trying to recover from financial ruin and disaster in the, the early 20s or 30s with the Great Depression. The U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR, he wants nothing more than to get right financially in America and do all they can to remain isolationist and avoid conflict in Europe or you know, foreign entanglements, as George Washington said that he should years earlier. So, 1930s, we're going to see the U.S. remain largely isolationist. However, with that, they signed a document that we should know, known as the Lend-Lease Act. So 
But 1940, the war is already beginning, or already has taken place, or started. The Lend-Lease Act was the U.S. passing a law that said they're going to give billions of dollars to the war effort on behalf of their allies. So America is going to funnel money to England and eventually to Russia as well against Nazi Germany and Italy and eventually the Japanese. So it's the funneling of money and also the offering of military aid and armaments to support uh, countries with a similar philosophy, uh, namely the English. So the Lend-Lease Act is passed in 1940. Um, and again, it gives us a chance to maybe avoid uh, being entangled in this conflict for a bit longer. However, that's going to change. Let's fast forward now to 1941. So 1941, the U.S. has largely turned a deaf ear to the uh, growing Japanese imperialism. That's going to change. The Japanese in 41, you know, fall of 1941, they invade a region known as French Indochina. With the Japanese invasion of French Indochina, finally America has had enough. At this point in time, we're going to begin an economic embargo, a trade embargo or economic sanctions against uh, J uh, the Japanese. We stopped trading at that point in time, the things they needed as a, um, as a um, island nation. We stopped trading, again, iron ore and oil, uh, largely. So with this trade embargo, the Japanese now are in a little bit of a predicament. They're going to send to Washington, D.C. in November of 1941 what they refer to as a peace delegation. A peace delegation of diplomats and ambassadors who travel from Japan to Washington, D.C. to try to hammer out or negotiate some kind of uh, peace treaty or some kind of um, you know, common ground between the two countries, the Japanese and the Americans. Those peace delegates are actually in Washington, D.C. on December 7th, 1941, a day that will forever live in infamy, according to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So here we go, guys. America tries to remain isolationist. That's going to change right here. As you know, it's going to be the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is our main naval base on the island of Oahu at Hawaii. So Pearl Harbor, our main naval base, is attacked December 7th, 1941, 7.30 in the morning uh, on a Sunday. And again, the Japanese chose this day for this air raid, or that time for an air raid, to guarantee massive uh, casualties. You know, the American sailors were all mostly asleep uh, inside the halls of these ships, and it guaranteed uh, a disastrous number of fatalities for the U.S. So we see the attack at Pearl Harbor by Japanese planes. Uh, we lose 18 boats. 18 battleships, cruisers, destroyers are either sunk and, and permanently uh, out of the war or damaged badly. We are crippled by this uh, Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor. Let's look at a few more items here uh, of um, importance in the days, weeks, and months after the attack at Pearl Harbor. Um, the next day, FDR is going to give a speech, and again, he declares this a day that will live in infamy, and he declares war on the Japanese. Both the English and the Americans declare war on the Japanese due to this treacherous uh, act, uh, or this uh, scandalous attack on the American fleet. A couple days later now, we're going to see that the, the Germans falling back on the old tripartite pact, they declare war along with the Japanese on America. So now America, trying to remain out of the war, we're now involved in the Pacific, and now Germany has also declared war on us as well, and we're now entangled in a different web of conflict in Europe as well. So early December, we are now fighting two different wars against two uh, separate but, but equal foes, the Japanese and the Germans. Okay, we've lost 18 boats. A um, couple more things I want to mention here about Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, different boats that are now part of the popular consciousness. Uh, the California, the Oklahoma, the Utah, 
the USS Shaw. All these boats now are part of the narrative. They all were sunk and mostly brought up eventually from the floor of Pearl Harbor. Now the one boat uh, that really has become truly iconic is of course the Arizona. The Arizona uh, could not be brought back up and remains today as a lasting memorial to, to Pearl Harbor and the troops who lost their lives that day and throughout World War II. So the Arizona today remains on the floor of Pearl Harbor. Now, as the story goes, a day before, one day prior to the attack on the 6th of December, they pumped 1.5 million gallons of gasoline into the Arizona for a future uh, trip um, or future excursion uh, pre-war. 1.5 million gallons of, uh, of gasoline. To this day, we refer to what's called the Tears of the Arizona. The Tears of the Arizona, every day, nine quarts of oil or gasoline still leaks from the Arizona. So there's like a permanent oil slick still on the surface of the Pearl Harbor waters that um, emits from the USS uh, Arizona. Uh, to honor those who lost their lives and those who survived this attack by the Japanese. To this day, those who survived and have gone on to live long lives, they still have the option, former you know, veterans of World War II and who served on the Arizona can choose to have their remains placed inside of an urn. And they actually swim their, the urn with their bodily remains uh, and they place them under a gun turret uh, on the floor of the, um, or on the ocean floor there at Pearl Harbor on the deck of the USS Arizona. Over 30 veterans of that conflict who survived chose to have the remains there. So there's been lots of discussion over the years. Hey, can we bring up the Arizona? It's an ecological disaster. Um, over the years, they have decided that, hey, by bringing her up might cause unknown problems ecologically, but also it is hollowed ground, hollow territory uh, involving the U.S. conflict and the bravery, the heroism of those who survived and those who did not. Okay, so back to this topic now. Pearl Harbor is going to get America into World War II, as you know. We are crippled and we are really uh, in, a, in a bad way militarily and not ready for this conflict. Before we go back into the U.S. fighting, the U.S. experience, I want to make mention of one final item that occurs in early 1942 that, you know, really we talk about FDR as a fabulous president, and he was. Most historians, they make these lists and they rank all the presidents and um, whatever your political persuasion, most historians do place FDR top five, if not one or two. However, a couple of things to mention that certainly are stains and uh, in the negative points to be made about the FDR administration. Number one, in the 30s, the Roosevelt administration did put a cap on European Jews who are trying to escape the terror of Nazi Germany. Um, and we think about all of those who did not get out and if perhaps we could have opened the, the doors to more immigration, how many lives could have been saved by the U.S. during the 1930s. So that cap is, is definitely um, a negative on his record. Secondly, I want to know for Wednesday's quiz, in the months after Pearl Harbor, FDR is going to pass what is called Executive Order 9066. So uh, again, Executive Order 9066. So with this uh, law, they're going to create internment camps or detention centers or camps uh, for Japanese Americans. Over 70,000 Japanese Americans, again, they were citizens of the US. They were accountants and butchers and bakers and teachers and all kinds of uh, productive people were put in these detention camps in inhospitable regions of the American Far West. You know, barbed wire and little houses, and they were forced to, you know, young and old, uh, spend their wartime years, um, uh, you know, in that kind of a really, really inhospitable, dark situation. So again, the Americans under FDR 
Uh, due to fear of the Japanese and an attack on California, there's no excuse, but they create detention camps for Japanese Americans. Let's start now militarily what happened in the Pacific theater of war after Pearl Harbor. Now, as you know, America is not in a good place. We're not prepared. We're trying to remain isolationist. We've now lost uh, our fleet uh, at Pearl Harbor, the surprise attack on uh, December 7th, 1941. If there was one positive, one positive thing that actually was a feather in our cap as uh, our experience in World War II begins, it's the fact that really war had changed at this point in time. By the 1940s, even in the 30s, military uh, had changed. Uh, back in the day, naval power was dictated by your battleships, your destroyers, but certainly your battleships. We lost many battleships and destroyers at Pearl Harbor. However, military uh, at sea had changed. By the 30s and the 40s, it was mostly dictated by massive aircraft carriers, you know, maybe 800, 900 feet long. Aircraft carriers where planes could take off and attack indirectly and then land back again. So aircraft carriers was the new wave of the future militarily. And back to that good point for the US or the one positive as this conflict begins, all of our aircraft carriers or all of the American aircraft carriers were out on a mission or out to sea. We did not lose one carrier during the Pearl Harbor attack. Now the first conflict I wanna to get to today, um, 1942. Now understand that the first several months were a disaster for the Americans. After the attack at Pearl Harbor, you know, we weren't sure what was up or down. We were really in a confused place trying to regroup and rebuild. Almost right away, we begin to lose our, um, our holdings in the Pacific to the Japanese. After Pearl Harbor, we lose Wake Island. We lose the Marshall Islands. We lose Guam. Eventually, we lose uh, the, the Philippines as well. We're just losing islands and land hand over fist to the Japanese. Now, in May of 1943, we have our first relative success. Our first relative success is known as the Battle of the Coral Sea. So May of 1942, the Battle of the Coral Sea. I say a relative success. Let's call it a draw. We lost an aircraft carrier known as the USS Lexington. So it went down in the drink and it was sunk by the Japanese. So we lose the Lexington uh, at the Battle of uh, the Coral Sea. We also lose uh, temporarily, we had serious uh, damages to a very, very iconic boat or aircraft carrier known as the USS Yorktown. So let me jot that name down. The USS Yorktown was badly damaged also at the Battle of the Coral Sea. Now, one good thing for the Americans to mention from the Coral Sea is that we did open up a supply line, a clean supply line uh, from Hawaii, uh, the waters to Australia. Our one ally, the Americans' one ally in the Pacific were the Australians, and we opened a supply line clean to uh, Australia from Hawaii. That was a positive. Now back to the Yorktown. The Yorktown was badly damaged, as I mentioned, and they really thought that it was done for. The Japanese reported back the Yorktown uh, has been hit and will, be, will capsize very soon. The Americans are going to somehow manage to get the Yorktown back to uh, Hawaii, to Pearl Harbor, and they believed there was a major Japanese offensive soon to occur in the summer of 1942. They needed the Yorktown back floating immediately. So they get the Yorktown back to dry dock at, um, at Pearl Harbor. And uh, when they assess the damages, the mechanics were like, hey, this is, a pretty, this is a pretty serious deal here. This might take two, maybe three weeks to repair her and get her back floating again. They found every man, woman, child and gave everyone a screwdriver, a wrench, a hammer, a blowtorch. Long story short, they're going to, against the odds, get the Yorktown floating in 48 hours, unbeknownst to the Japanese, and that becomes a pretty important part of the narrative. So, 
Summer of 1942, very, very significant time uh, in this part of the war, this time, this campaign for the U.S. So maybe jot this down right now, a header for yourselves, the Battle of Midway. The Battle of Midway um, is going to take place June 4th, 1942. June 4th, 1942, it's going to become the turning point in the Pacific uh, theater of war. It's the Pacific version of the Battle of Stalingrad in Europe. So Battle of Midway, uh, M-I-D-W-A-Y. So a little bit of background here, guys. Uh, after the attack at the Battle of the Coral Sea, Yamamoto, Yamamoto, who again is the, the, um, the powerful Japanese admiral who ordered the attack at Pearl Harbor, he began to fret. He feared that with the draw, the, the even fight at the Battle of the Coral Sea, and the fact that the Americans had begun to attack the coast of, uh, of Japan uh, via a raid known as the Doolittle Raid, the Doolittle Raid, coupled with the even fight at the Battle of the Coral Sea, Yamamoto began to believe that unless the Japanese could um, defeat America, within six months, they would lose the war. American industrial might would kick in, American spirit, call it what you will. Yamamoto believed that unless they you know, served up or dealt a deciding blow against the American fleet, the Americans would defeat them. So he panics a little bit. Yamamoto panics and begins to think and uh, talk to his upper brass about a major attack somewhere in the Pacific against the American fleet to get the U.S. out of World War II. The island they choose for this attack will become Midway. Midway, M-I-D-W-A-Y, as I said. Now, a bit of background on Midway. Uh, Midway is um, equidistant. It's about you know halfway between the Orient to the Far East and California. It's like right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's the furthest most Western American holding in the Pacific Ocean. It's right near the international date line. It'd be like the final place where the sun would go down uh, in this part of the world. So the international date line is where uh, Midway is located. There are two different islands. They're both tiny. One's called Sand Island and one's called Eastern Island. They're approximately 2.5 square miles. Okay, so it's a tiny little island called Midway that comprises two little areas, uh, both coral in character or makeup, uh, Eastern and Sand. It is a naval base and an air base for the U.S. during World War II. Now, let's go back a little bit. It's an important moment here for the U.S. and talking about what happens uh, at Midway. In the 19-teens and 20s, as aviation, as flight began to pick up a little bit and, and technology uh, involving aviation began to catch up some, uh, Pan Am, Pan American Airlines, bought the island of Midway. So Pan Am is going to purchase Midway as a dropping off point, a, a point for uh, their, their planes to land and then take off again to reach the Far East, namely China. Now, Pan Am had a, a very interesting new innovation known as the China Clipper. The China Clipper was a flying boat. Okay, it was a flying boat, call it a boat, call it a plane, it was both. The China Clipper would arrive from California, it would land in the harbor at Midway and drop off. It's very affluent uh, guests. Uh, there at the hotel for a night's lodging on Midway and then fly to the Orient the next day. So this flying uh, boat would land there uh, for Pan Am. Now, an important point here is that Pan Am is going to lay an underground cable, an underground telegraph from Midway back to Honolulu, back to Hawaii, uh, just for their own purposes, but they laid a telegraph wire on the ocean floor to communicate with Hawaii or with Honolulu. So back to our story, 1942, we're going to see a major role here involving cryptology or code breaking. The importance of covert activities, cryptology or code breaking in World War II. 
For America, the home base for cryptology in the Pacific was located at um, a place known as Station Hypo. Station Hypo, H-Y-P-O. Now the leader of Station Hypo, very interesting eccentric character. His name was Captain Joseph Rochefort. Captain Joseph Rochefort. You spell Rochefort uh, R-O-C-H-E-F-O-R-T. R-O-C-H-E-F-O-R-T. Captain Joseph Rochefort, a centric character, was a captain in the Navy. Now, he didn't take the conventional path to the military. He was a high school dropout, but he was exceedingly good at crossword puzzles. And somehow this gave him uh, the knack for breaking codes, or he had the right sort of gray matter to process these numbers. So crossword puzzles and numbers and, and interesting equations. So he is the leader of Station Hypo in, during World War II, during these early years of the war. And he worked incessantly, he worked nonstop. He was obsessed with breaking Japanese codes. He never left. He wore a smoking jacket or a robe and slippers and he would stay there and work these ungodly hours into the wee hours every night. And during the, the months of May into early June, 1942, Rochefort started to see the same two letters, A-F, A-F. Now I'll say it again, he kept seeing A-F, A-F, A-F. Now they knew there was an attack to come from Japan somewhere in the Pacific. They knew it was at A-F, they knew it was gonna be an attempt by the Japanese to knock the Americans out of the war. They just didn't know where A-F might be. They had no idea. They thought it might be midway. So they knew when, they knew what. They didn't know definitively where. Rochefort has a curious idea. He makes this um, up this great scheme, this great idea. They're going to float out into the airwaves to be decrypted or decoded by the Japanese. They throw out a bogus rumor, the US under uh, Rochefort does, that there is no salt water, sorry, there's no fresh water at, um, at Midway. The desalination plant at um, Midway is broken down. There's no fresh water, just salt water. Okay, they, they toss out that bogus rumor and they wait. So what came over or what did the U.S. under Rochefort, they were able to decode what message shortly after. They waited and they, they were able to decode from Japanese no fresh water at AF. No fresh water at AF. At that point in time, they realized, okay, we know there's going to be an attack. We know it's going to be June 4th, and we know AF, and AF is in fact the island of Midway. So here we go, guys. An important day, it's a turning point in the war for the Americans, the attack at Midway. So. June 4th, we're going to see a major attack by the Japanese aircraft carriers. One, two, three, and four, count them. Aircraft carriers attack Midway. And uh, they make a pretty crucial mistake. They bomb the heck out of the island. They leave the airstrip uh, unattended or they miss the airstrip. So that's a pretty major mistake. But the planes do go back to their four aircraft carriers and uh, they scored it as a huge victory. Visually, they report back that, hey, we saw Midway, it was in rubble, it was in flames, it was a success. Uh, let's go back to our, our aircraft carriers and refuel. Now, the chief rear admiral, the rear admiral for the US who organizes this counterattack at Midway, his name was Chester Nimitz. So the counterattack by the Americans at Midway Orchestrated, led by the Rear Admiral Chester Nimitz, N-I-M-I-T-Z, Rear Admiral of Fame in the U.S. Navy. So as the, as the uh, Japanese pilots are refueling on the decks of their aircraft carriers, there were three American aircraft carriers off in the distance, way beyond the horizon, unbeknownst to the Japanese. You had the WASP. You had the Enterprise, and you had, you guessed it, the Yorktown floating again, okay? Unbeknownst to the Japanese. You had three aircraft carriers uh, off in the distance, and 
Out of nowhere, American planes showed up and dropped uh, copious bombs onto the aircraft carriers. Uh, as these guys are refueling, their planes turn into a fiery grave. We see this counterattack led to the loss of four aircraft carriers for the Japanese, four aircraft carriers, hundreds of their best pilots, and many, many planes as well. So I'll say it again, the Japanese lose at Midway, four aircraft carriers, their best pilots, and over 100 planes. It's a decisive twist of fate for the Americans in the Pacific. The Americans do lose one aircraft carrier. And today, it actually was uh, discovered in 1998, uh, it's watery grave, and I'll post these images on Schoology later on, the USS uh, Yorktown finally does um, reach its, uh, its Waterloo, so to speak, at um, the Battle of Midway. They lose the Yorktown, which is already uh, on thin ice, but they lose that one the aircraft carrier. Decisive victory for the U.S., all because of AF and cryptology and Ro uh, Joseph Rochefort, as well as the uh, attack plan by Chester Nimitz. One last thing, we'll call it a night, is that following the Battle of Midway, American confidence soars now, and they go on the attack. They're going to implement a new philosophy, not defensive, but offensive. It's known as island hopping, and uh, tomorrow when I uh, begin once again, I'll begin with a new philosophy by the U.S. called island hopping. Have a great night, guys. Thanks a lot. See you tomorrow. Bye.